Good morning, church. My name is Eunsoo Kang. I'm one of the associate pastors here. Let us go before God in opening prayer. The word will be shown on your screen. Holy and loving God, meet us here. Dwell among us and revive us. Good morning, everyone. Grace and peace to you in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. My name is Doug Lane, and I just want to welcome you to The Vine, our online campus here at Wrightsville United Methodist Church. And it's now August, and that means here at Wrightsville, Camp Meeting Month. Camp Meeting Month means you're going to see us dress down a little bit. You're going to hear a little bit different music from, you know, maybe about 100 years ago. Um, you're going to hear some testimonies. We're going to hear testimonies from some of our church members and even our pastors. In fact, the question that they're going to be answering each week during August is, what in the world made you want to be United Methodist? And so today we're going to hear from Pastor David, our Minister of Visitation, as he answers the question and tells an extraordinary story about how God has been working in his life. So I hope you'll stick with us and worship with us throughout the day. Thanks for joining us. Good morning, church. My name is Eunsoo Kang. I'm one of the associate pastors here. Let us go before God in opening prayer. The word will be shown on your screen. Holy and loving God, meet us here. Dwell among us and revive us. Find our spirits open and our hearts receptive to your word for us this day. With our songs and prayers, our witness and reflection, may we faithfully go where you call us to be. In your holy name we pray. Amen. My name is Renan Hoff and I'm a 10th grader at Hogger High School. I was one of the 12 lucky people to go on the mission trip to El Salvador. My favorite part of the trip was delivering food to the people in the community of La Gloria because this experience helped me grow spiritually and it showed me how even though these people didn't have much and were living in poverty, they were so happy and grateful for what they had. I can't forget the thing that made this trip as fun and inclusive as it was, Pastor David. Pastor David spent his time making us laugh, teaching us, helping us grow not only as people, but as children of God, and making the trip an overall great experience. I especially enjoyed hanging out with the Salvadorian students and playing soccer with them. Thank you so much for this wonderful opportunity and providing me with a great experience that I will forever cherish. I come to the garden below While the dew is still on the roses And the boys are here Falling on my head, the Son of God discloses. And He walks with me, and He talks with me, and He tells me I am His own. And the joy we share as we tarry there, none other has ever. I stay in the garden with him 
though the night around me be falling. But he bids me go through the voice of woe. His voice to me is calling. And he walks with me and he talks with me and he tells me I am his own. And the joy we share as we carry that none other has ever I invite you now to bow your heads with me in prayer. One body, one spirit, one hope, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who's above all and through all and in all. Lord, take this patchwork collection of people and quilt us together as a church. Like old piece of, pieces of cloth, Take our words and our songs and our prayers. Take our thoughts and our inner hunger and join them all together into a new and living fabric, the purpose of which is to cover and color your world, or at least our corner of it, with grace and love. Father, we know we live in a divided country, a divided world, sometimes even divided homes. Help us to love in spite of our differences. Help us to focus on the things we all share in common. And when we cannot find common ground, teach us how to love like Jesus, who taught us to love our enemies and even went to the cross for our sins. Lord, in this broken and hurting world, send your healing touch to those who are sick, those who grieve, those who are in poverty, those who are poor in spirit, those living through wartime, those experiencing pain, and all those we lift up before you now. And now, Father, we come before your throne of grace, praying the prayer that Jesus taught his disciples to pray as we say together, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us, not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. And now is a time where we reflect on what God has given to us, and give you the opportunity to give back as you feel led. And so you can always give to the ministries of Wrightsville United Methodist Church by simply going to our website, rightsvilleumc.org. And you can go to the, um, to the place where we can uh, make donations or give. And um, that's probably the simplest way, but you can also write a check and send that in to P.O. Box 748, Wrightsville Beach, North Carolina, 28480. Um, and we certainly appreciate um, all the the offerings that come in to support this ministry here at church. Hi, Wrightsville kids. I'm Pastor Julia. And today, I want to talk to you about our church. You probably know that this church is called Wrightsville United Methodist Church. But did you know that the United Methodist Church is bigger than just Wrightsville? There are thousands of churches, not even just here in Wilmington or in North Carolina or in America, but in the whole world, there are United Methodist churches. And part of what it means to be part of the United Methodist Church is to be a part of this whole big family that goes across the whole world. I have something today to help you think about how we are all connected. So in the Methodist Church, we 
have individual churches like Wrightsville. But we also have something that's called a district. And even past a district, we have something that's called a conference. <laughs> Sometimes life together can be a little bit messy, but that's part of how it's fun. And not only do we have a conference, but we have a jurisdiction. And we have lots of different types of leaders. We have bishops and district superintendents. And most importantly, we have church members just like you. Man, you can start to see all the ways that we're connected. I'm so happy to be a part of something that's so big and that's so connected. It's like an awesome, awesome family. And you know, you can see how when we have all of these together, it's a lot stronger and cooler than just one of these strands by themselves. And that's how it is in the church too. I'm so glad to be part of this really cool family called the United Methodist Church. Let's say a prayer together while we keep holding on to our awesome connection. <laughs> Dear God, thank you for making me. Thank you for our church. And thank you for the whole United Methodist Church. Help us stay connected. We love you. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Hello, I'm Pastor David Haley, one of your associate pastors, a minister of visitation here at Wrightsville United Methodist Church. And I have the great privilege of being able to read God's Word and then preach from God's Word for you today. Our scripture reading comes from the book of Ephesians in the New Testament, chapter 2, verses 8 through 10. For it is by grace you have been saved, through faith, and this is not from yourselves. It is the gift of God, not by works, so that no one can boast. For we are God's handiwork, created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. This is the word of God for us, the people of God. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, send your Holy Spirit into our midst that our hearts might be prepared to hear your word. May your anointing be upon the one who preaches that his sins and shortcomings, though they be many, might not hinder your word. Through Jesus Christ our Lord we pray. Amen. Well, as Pastor Doug alluded earlier, uh, the pastors have been challenged to preach this month about why I am United Methodist during the August camp meeting month services. It reminds me of the ministerial association meeting that I heard about where one of the pastors asked the others, if Jesus came back today, which church would he join? Of course, the Baptist pastor said, well, I'm sure that Jesus would join the Baptist church because we baptize the right way. And the Catholic priest said, well, he would certainly join the Catholic church because it was established by Simon Peter. And so on, it continued around the room. And then finally, it was the United Methodist pastor's turn. And he said, well, I, I believe you'd find Jesus in the United Methodist church. Well, the other pastors ask uh, what his reasoning was, the United Methodist pastor said, I just don't believe he'd move his membership. <clears throat> now, last Sunday, Pastor Doug mentioned that three of your pastors did not grow up in the United Methodist Church. And I was one of those. 
I was raised in the little town of Chiral, South Carolina. We were poor, and I was the last of five children. Uh, my take on it was that my parents kept having children until they got one they liked. I, I don't say that around my siblings. Anyway, I grew up in the First Baptist Church of Chiral, where I joined the church at an early age, as was the custom. Now, when I entered my teen years in the late 1960s, I began to realize that something was missing from my life. I had plans. I wanted to work for NASA in the space program. I had a great job in high school working as a DJ and newscaster for the local radio station. I was having a good time partying. I had many friends. In fact, when I attended my high school 20-year class reunion, there were classmates who said to Binky, my wife, David was the last person we ever thought would be a preacher. But despite the fun I was having, I began to realize that something was lacking, something was missing. When I was 17 years old, just after I completed my junior year in high school back in 1968, I committed my life to Jesus Christ. I remember well the night that it happened. I came home very late from partying. I sat on the edge of my bed and I felt miserable. And then I got down on my knees and I prayed something like this. I said, God, if you're really who you say you are and if you can really do what you say you can do, then I want you to do it in my life. And it was in that, at that point that my life began to grow in a much different and much better direction. A little more than one year later, I committed my life to full-time Christian service as a minister. And my life embarked on a journey that ultimately has brought me to stand before you today as a semi-retired pastor. I started out serving Baptist churches. Many of you know my story how in the 1980s and early 1990s, I worked full-time in prison ministry with Chuck Colson and Prison Fellowship Ministries. Later, I served as pastor of an independent church and also worked on the international staff of Habitat, Habitat for Humanity in the late 1990s. When I was serving as pastor of an independent church, I came to realize that God was calling me to be a part of something, part of something bigger than just a local congregation. And as I, I searched, I came across some writings of John Wesley, who was the founder of the Methodist movement some 300 years ago. My heart resonated with what I was reading the writings of John Wesley. I kept saying, this is what I've always believed, now that he says it this way. <laughs> and there are three terms that capture what I read in John Wesley's writings, and they are what God used, me, used to draw me to the United Methodist Church. The first term is the word grace. Grace. You know, like we sing about in the song, amazing grace, how sweet the sound. Now, by definition, grace is when God gives us good things that we can't earn. There are two aspects of grace that I believe are very important. The first is the grace that God gives to us. For example, in John 3, 16, For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son, that whoever believes in Him should not perish, but have eternal life. And we see also in Romans 5, 8, but God demonstrates His own love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. We do not deserve God's love. We do not deserve God's grace. And we can do nothing to earn it. Our scripture from Ephesians 2 makes clear that it is God's gift offered to each of us simply because God loves us. The second aspect of God's grace 
focuses on the grace that we extend to others. We are not in competition with one another to be God's favorite. God is not going to love you more because you find some fault in another believer that you can, can condemn them for. I know these days it seems like some Christians take great delight in proving that they are the most faithful. And of course, God must love them best. But the scriptures don't support that. And Jesus actually fussed at his disciples when some of them argued over who was the greatest. Grace, God's amazing grace, is one of the hallmark, the hallmarks of our faith in the United Methodist Church. The second term is the term good works. Uh, Chuck Colson wrote a book back in the 1980s, uh, actually when I was working for him, called Loving God. Uh, it's not like describing a loving God. This is more like how we're going to love God. I consider it to be his best book. And his premise is that the way to truly love God is to obey God. Jesus said, if you love me, keep my commands. And in John uh, chapters 14 and 15, for example, over and over Jesus says, this is my commandment, love one another. This is my commandment, love one another. The word for love in the Greek is the word agape that you probably heard before. It's used to describe God's love for us. It also has the idea of love in action. It's far more than simple affection. It is love that does something, that does something positive. In Ephesians chapter 2, Paul is clear that our good works do not earn God's grace. But he points out that we are created by God to put love into action to do good works, the works which God prepared in advance for us to do. Our good works are such an important part of our Christian faith that God actually prepared a list of them in advance. Did you ever stop to think about what is on God's list for you to do? What acts of love was God planning for you to do? Are you doing them? The good works that God calls us to do should mirror the teachings and actions of Jesus. Feed the hungry, visit the prisoner and the sick, and so on. John Wesley is said to have challenged his followers, do all the good you can, by all the means you can, in all the ways you can, in all the places you can, at all the times you can, to all the people you can, as long as ever you can. Our Wesleyan heritage is a strong dual emphasis on God's grace and good works. I believe this so strongly that I've dedicated the past more than 40 years of my life and ministry to sharing the gospel and responding to human need as a witness to the gospel. I spent nine years going to those in prison. I've helped build houses for the poor in eight different countries. I've led medical mission teams on four continents. This stuff is part of our United Methodist DNA, and it's a big part of why I am a United Methodist today. But there's one more key factor, connection. Connection. I'm going to read a short list of names. See how many you recognize. Christian May Batson, Maddie Yarborough, Roy Sandlin, Arthur and Mary Kreider. Do you recognize any of those names? Uh, if you've ever been in our church building, you may or may not remember them because they are some of the names that are on our stained glass windows. 
uh, Christian May Batson lived on the beach and was a church member in the early years. Maddie Yarborough was, uh, I'm told, was a great aunt of Phyllis Millard and one of the early members of Wrightsville United Methodist Church. Roy Sandlin was surely a founding father of this church with his wife Doris, who was so dedicated to the establishment of Wrightsville United Methodist Church. We even have a Sunday school class named after him. Arthur and Mary Kreider were very dedicated to the church in its early years and dedicated to the finances of the church. As I said, these names are on some of the stained glass windows in our church. In the United Methodist Church, we believe in the communion of saints. We are closely connected with other believers, including those who pass before us, including those on whose shoulders we stand today. We would not have the church that we have today apart from the faithfulness of these individuals that I've listed and many others who have passed before us. John Wesley said, there's no religion that's not social, no holiness that is not social. And what he's saying is that Christianity is a group activity, a team sport. Now that goes against our cultural value of individualism. In fact, in many churches we talk about knowing Jesus as your personal Savior, and that's true. But we can't exclude the community aspect of our faith. Our faith goes way beyond what I experience, what I want, what I like, or what I don't like. We are part of a communion of saints working together, worshiping together, working for the kingdom, caring for one another. It may be true that you can worship God on your boat or on the golf course or in the woods, when I'm on a mountain snow skiing, it is definitely a spiritual experience for me. And I mean that in a positive sense, not if, Lord, if you just get me off this mountain, <laughs> because I do love to snow ski. But God's plan has always been that God's people will come together and create a worshiping, praying, serving community. I found this idea often lacking in other church experiences but it's part of the DNA of the United Methodist Church. About 25 years ago, I began my journey towards Methodism. 22 years ago, I accepted my first appointment in the United Methodist Church. I found the spiritual home that God was leading me to. With the emphasis on God's grace, on good works, and on connection. I'm sure the United Methodist Church is not perfect. One of my friends, in fact, suggested that it became even less perfect once I joined. But the United Methodist Church has nurtured me in my faith and given me opportunities to serve, and I'm grateful. There was once a boy who was awkward, shy, and immature. He constantly got into trouble now, he wasn't like a felon, but he was just always getting into mischief. When he was six years old, he got glasses, and they were really thick, and they made his eyes look really big. One of his friends said that his eyes looked like a grasshopper, and that became his nickname for a number of years, not as a term of affection, but as a term of ridicule. As grasshopper grew up, he strayed from the straight and narrow. But then he found Jesus and committed his life to Jesus. And Jesus gave his life new meaning and purpose. And no one ever called me grasshopper again. Jesus led me into ministry. Jesus led me into prison ministry. Jesus led me into Habitat for Humanity International. Jesus led me to the United Methodist Church. That's why I'm a United Methodist today. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, amen. Let us pray. 
Lord God, you've called each of us to be on a journey. A journey moving our lives towards you, following your lead and your guidance. Lead us, O oh Lord, and help us to find our way. Help us to find our way to the church family, the church connection, where we can grow in our faith and love and serve you. We give thanks today for the United Methodist Church and all that it has meant to us in our lives, to all that it will mean to us in our lives in the future. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. My prayer today is that God will be leading and guiding you in your life and that you will follow His leadership and guidance. And so let us go forth to love and serve God in all that we do. And as we go, may God's blessing go with us. The blessing of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Good morning, church. My name is Eun Siu Kang. I'm one of the associate pastors here. Let us go before God in opening prayer. The word will be shown on your screen. Holy and loving God, meet us here. Dwell among us and revive us. Find our spirits open and our hearts receptive to your word for us this day. With our songs and prayers, our witness and reflection.